Okay, so everybody, thanks for coming to uh, SJJ or Junji's or One Punch Man's uh, defense. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Junji's been with us for this is your seventh year. Yes. Right, as you all probably know, Junji's been working on many projects at Romella. Huge contribution. His main baby was that single wheel balancing uh, robots. You probably remember that Ombro thing, but we decided to change this topic. We wanted to attack some more challenging uh, topics, so we changed it to a bipedal locomotion Recording robot. Recording in progress. Uh, so, yeah, without any further ado, it's all yours. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Jun Jie and welcome to my dissertation defense. And the topic is locomotion analysis and control of a miniature bipedal robot. So recently, uh, the topic of humanoid robots has been placed under the spotlight. Uh, Cyber One Xiaomi's first humanoid robot debuted this. Uh, okay, so Xiaomi's first humanoid robot uh, debuted this August in Beijing. Just uh, months later, Optimus was unveiled at Tesla AI Day. And of course, there are many, many remarkable humanoid robots that we are already familiar with. For example, Asimo from Honda, Cassie and Digi from Agility Robotics, and of course, Alice from Boston Dynamics. And more and more companies have been working on human robots. People are just so crazy about it lately. Yeah, and actually, it's not just now. From the dawn of time, humans have been trying to recreate themselves uh, using the technology of the age. The history of human robots can be roughly broken down into three phases of meta early robots and modern autonomous robots. And so first, automata are known as the early ancestors of robots, but technically they are not robots because they are you know, just mechanical devices automatically following a sequence of uh, move motions. And there are many good examples, but unfortunately most of them are just sketches or works. And the term robot was first used to denote a fictional human robot in a play in 1920. And the robots in the early hundreds, although they are equipped with more advanced mechanical structure, capable of more dynamic, um, more complicated behaviors, however, they are considered more as automata because at its most basic, they lack the sense of autonomy. And the term robotics was not coined until the year 1942. And later in uh, 1954, uh, with the rise of modern computers, uh, the world's first digitally operated and programmable robot, Unimate, was invented, <coughs> representing the foundation of modern robotics industry. And later in 1973, Professor Kato from Waseda University introduced the world's first humanoid robot, Wabo One. And later, uh, you know, Honda just started their uh, well known E series and then P series, which eventually led to uh, the Asimo robot you just saw previously. So that's uh, a, brief, uh, a brief history of human and robots. So why people are so crazy about human and robots? Why the human form, right? So what is impressive about humans is their capabilities of you know, navigating the world and manipulating the world around them. People can run, people can swim, people can climb, people can do, uh, pretty much go anywhere and do anything they want. It is this ability that we wish to replicate in machines that someday uh, that can potentially overturn our daily lives. And meanwhile, there's no denying that the human world is designed for humans. I mean, the door size, the step height, and all the tools we use, right? So if the robot is not of the human form, then we might have to recreate all of these for robot use only, which may take too much effort. And finally, psychologically, the human form also looks more approachable uh, as you know, living and working partners. So for decades, we have seen the incredible performance of automation robots you know, in the factories. Um, however, we have yet to see uh, humanoid robots be utilized to aid human in the real world. This is due in part uh, to the fact that the approaches to effectively navigating these two environments are different. So in the factories, the environments are structured and controlled. Um, the robots are typically fully actuated. Uh, with a fixed space, which grants them full control authority at all times. And the states can be directly measured with high accuracy. And meanwhile, interaction with the environment are not required. 
and instead high stiffness, high precision, high uh, strengths are preferred. Under these conditions, simple control uh, strategies can be used. Unfortunately, this is not the case with the real robot, uh, with the robot in the real world, um, where the environments can be unstructured and can be changing all the time. And by removing the fixed contact with the ground, the robots can become, the system can become underactuated. And the states can now no longer be directly measured. Instead, of, instead uh, sensor fusion, advanced fielding techniques are required. And whenever a robot makes a foot contact, or, or whenever a foot makes contact with the ground, uh, a collision occurs, imparting an impulse to the system. And these collisions need to be carefully, effectively mitigated for the sake of system stability. Under these conditions, more advanced uh, motion planning and control algorithms are required. And technically, uh, quadruped robot uh, faces a similar difficult position. However, recently, a uh, significant faster development in quadruped robot has been witnessed. Compared to a quadruped robot, a bipedal robot is more mechanically complex, requiring more powerful actuators, uh, more degrees of freedom, and they are more intrinsically unstable. So this poses two critical challenges in the study of humanoid robots. The first one is accessibility to the hardware platform is limited, as it either takes too much effort to develop a humanoid robot independently, or the commercially available ones, if any, are too expensive to afford. And second, as uh, bipedal robots, uh, as the bipedal system is considerable, considerably more challenging than a quadruped robot, more advanced, more efficient control algorithms are essential, especially for uh, the locomotion. So this dissertation aims at solving some of the problems uh, in these uh, challenges. In particular, first, a miniature bipedal robot uh, capable of dynamic behaviors is being under development. The robot is named Bruce Bipedal Robot Unit with compliance enhanced. It is expected to be a, uh, an open source platform for the robotic community in the near future. And second, a state-of-the-art uh, dynamic bipedal locomotion control framework is being studied. Um, the framework is general and versatile as it intends to achieve a strong robustness of stabilizing a wide range of bipedal locomotion gates, including walking, running, and hopping. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the overview of this, uh, of this dissertation. So first we have our robot Bruce. Uh, Bruce is of 0.6 meters height, adapting an average human body proportion. Um, it has a total and a two five degrees of freedom legs. Each leg, of Bruce, each leg of Bruce has a spherical hip joint, a single knee joint, and a single ankle joint. It also has a line contact with the ground. The Bruce robot is uh, fully actuated, controlled by a mini PC, powered by the LiPo battery, and equipped with a wireless e-stop in order to cut the power in emergencies. To have better torque transparency and compliance to the unknown environment, proprioceptive actuation are equipped using the VR actuator developed in our, world, in, in our lab. VR actuators are essentially high torque density, brushless DC motors. Uh, due to a large gap radius, uh, and therefore only a small amount of gearing is needed. It also equipped with inc uh, joint encoders for joint position and velocity feedback. An inertia measurement unit is mounted on the torso for acceleration and angular rate measurement. For Bruce being able to detect when the contact between the ground and the foot is created or not, a sensing foot is designed based on the working principle of electronic switches, which is directly inserted into the rubber content layer. All the sensor information is fused into the state's admission, uh, and based on that, we can derive the kinematic and dynamic model to get all the robot states ready for feedback control. And on the other hand, based on the user command, we can generate you know, the reference for our controller, for example, the working speed, the working velocity, uh, the working speed, the working direction. And the locomotion control is divided into two layers, where the high level plans the foot step, while the low level uh, controls the whole body motion while establishing the foot contact as planned. And eventually, the joint torque command is sent to the bear actuator to close the loop. Okay, so we will have time to go over each component, and let's start with the boost robot design. Okay, so conventional humanoid robot usually have very bucky legs. Uh, with a minimum of six degrees of freedom in order, to, in order to achieve any arbitrary foot position and orientation in 3D. 
And these robots typically have uh, rotary joints with servo motors in a theory configuration. That is, the actuators are directly located at each joint. And it strains lies in you know, the simplified structure and analysis. However, it comes at the drawback of limited capabilities. For example, accumulation of backlash and elasticity from each joint to the end, and more importantly, increased lag weight and inertia. The effect of uh, reduced joint rigidity and increased lag weight, in weight and inertia can be substantial when it comes to dynamic lag motion. Uh, however, at the time, it was not necessarily appreciated because the robots move so slow that the dynamic effect can be fairly neglected. So nowadays, the popular trend on humanoid uh, design is using lightweight lag with small foot, okay, um, which can lower the inertia and in the process, uh, reduce the control effort. There are many different approaches to achieve this paradigm in practice. For example, uh, topology optimized structure components with high strength to weight ratios. That is, suppose we have a part like this at the beginning, uh, we can have some, uh, we can do finite element analysis and based on the simulation result, we can just remove the structure that is unnecessary to reduce the weight. And of course, we can try, uh, try to use strong and light materials, for example, carbon fiber and titanium. And of course, the most prevalent option is to place the actuator off axis, as close to the torso as possible. Uh, which also, uh, this can also lead to some interesting uh, joint design uh, where parallel mechanisms can be involved. For example, um, a two degree of freedom cable driven pulley system is applied to the hip, pitch, and roll motions. Uh, the parallel configuration leads to the coupling of the two actuators. So when they are moving in the opposite direction, we can have the roll motion. When they are moving in the same direction, we can have the pitch motion. The scheme leads to uh, can reduce the inertia of the female link. It also exhibits high stiffness as as the uh, due to the mechanical power uh, coupling of the two actuators. It also can produce large torque because the two actuators are essentially powering the same joint. It also comes with a wide range of motion. And finally, cable driven system is well known for its uh, zero backlash feature. Because previously we are using a bevel gear to achieve a similar configuration. However, as you can see, the joint performance, the joint accuracy is very bad. The proximal uh, actuation principle is also applied to the lower leg design. So the knee actuators is at the knee joint, which is fine. However, for the ankle actuators, instead of placing at the ankle, which is uh, way too distal, we relocated to the female leg to reduce the inertia. As a result, two pairs of four bar linkage mechanisms are applied uh, to deliver torque to the ankle, uh, both of parallelogram shape with a one-to-one -one transmission ratio. So. Uh, that's some, just some design highlight of Bruce, and once we have the robot, we just play with it, we test its basic functionalities. For example, this is seesaw balancing, where we use an inertia measurement, uh, use an IMU to estimate the ground orientation, and uh, Bruce can keep its torso in the upright configuration based on the kinematic model. And to verify the dynamic capability of the robot, a vertical jumping test was conducted. And at that time, the, the trajectory are only hand designed, so uh, it might not even be dynamically consi consistent. But Bruce was still able to jump, and it was uh, almost a year ago. And just recently, Bruce can already perform jumping with an optimized tra trajectory. Uh, just a showcase of the dynamic capability of the robot. And of course, we also uh, do a preliminary working test where the trajectories are designed to be both kinematically and dynamically consistent. And with an open loop trajectory, Bruce was able to walk a considerable amount of distance. Okay. okay, so that's pretty much about our robot Bruce. And now let's shift our focus to the problem of bipedal locomotion. <clears throat> and we will start with some uh, background. Uh, bipedal locomotion has been you know, studied for decades, and yet it remains an active research field. 
the first control par paradigm using uh, the notion of static walking. That is, the center of pressure, a center of mass of the robot projection on the ground is always contained within the support polygon of the robot. The robot will not fall down even if the motion is suddenly stopped. And ever since, spectral locomotion has become more and more dynamic and natural. This is due to the continual progress in three key aspects. The mathematical understanding of bipedal locomotion, the computational ability to encode this mathematics, and of course, uh, the hardware capable of realizing this understanding in practice. We have just talked about the hardware perspective. Now let's uh, talk about the mathematical, mathematical modeling of bipedal robots. Bipedal robots can be considered as a tree of a tree of rigid body, one of which can serve as the basically typically the torso. You know, because interaction with the with uh, interaction with ground is always changing during locomotion. So one convenient way to model the system is to uh, construct a general a, a general a general representation of the robot floating in the air, and then uh, enforce ground contacts at the stance feet. This is typically known as the floating base model, where the configuration space is the position and orientation of the floating, uh, floating base joint, as well as the joint angle dictating the shape of the robot. The continuous dynamics can be uh, written in the Lagrangian form, where H is the inertia matrix, C is the Coriolis and centrifugal terms, G is the gravity, the constant matrix B defines how to control how the joint talks enter the model, and the J and F are respectively the foot contact Jacobian and the contact force at the contact location. And whenever a foot is uh, making a contact with the ground, uh, <coughs> it's assumed to be uh, stationary and differentiating once more yields the axillary constraint on the robot. And meanwhile, the contact force can not be arbitrary, right? At first, it is unilateral, meaning it can only push the ground, not pull the ground. And second, it also needs to respect the coolant friction. So in the end, uh, the feasible work space of the contact force can be represented by some cone shape. So the resulting dynamics is also called the full order dynamic model of the robot because it actually considers every single detail. It is highly nonlinear, high dimensional, time varying, multi input, multi output, strongly restricted. It's really a mess. So Due to the incurring complexity, virtually all approaches to achieving stable dynamic bipedal locomotion needs to tackle the problem as an optimal control problem, a, design, a control design process using mathematical optimization. Um, because, okay. so the fundamental idea is to you know, try to find a control over some period of time so that some, perform, some measurement of the performance can be optimized, for example, energy efficiency. And because uh, the and because the it's not possible to generate the analytical solution for any nonlinear general nonlinear system, therefore the te technique of trajectory optimization is widely adopted as a numerical approach, which computes an open loop trajectory instead of you know try to find optimal control role for the entire space space. However, trajectory optimization of bipedal locomotion in its most complete form is still extremely challenging, even offline. So we once trying to derive the dynamics for a simpler robot like this. However, the dynamic equation is already hundreds of pages. It's really, really insane. So due to limited computing uh, power of the early devices, this approach was still stuck with simple planar model by the end of 1990s. It was not until the year of 2000 that the optimal working motion of a complete 3D uh, robot can be, uh, can be solved. However, the curse of nonlinear optimization still limits uh, its performance. So first, the solution is highly sensi sensitive to the initial gas. A very bad initial gas can easily cause the problem infeasible. And second, even if the problem is feasible, uh, uh, often at best, a locally optimal solution is provided. Okay. So not being able to generate the gate online efficiently limits the robots to a predefined set of pre-computed actions, uh, potentially you know, ruining its reactivity in, uh, in the presence of even small perturbation. 
So one way to alleviate this serious limitation is to generate a database of charter queries, which can be queried online, uh, possibly conditioned on the current robot states and the commands in order to you know, improve the system, dynamic, system robustness. So to ease the computational burden of four-order approach, uh, another branch of bipedal locomotion is using simplified or the reduced order model which only focus on the most salient aspect of the system. For example, the center of mass of the robot, as well as the center of pressure on the foot, without you know, considering the complicated joint dynamics. The introduction of the reduced order model naturally breaks down the problem into multiple stages, as it does not consider every single detail during the planning. And a practical pra uh, paradigm is to have two layers, where the high level plans the footsteps, and the low-level controls the whole body motion while establish the foot contact as planned. And in this presentation, we're gonna use the reduced order approach because the derivation is neat, which can have analytical solution. And therefore, it's computational efficient, which can be performed online, able to mitigate issue related to reactivity. The disadvantage is that by breaking down the problem into several stages, the global optimality is sacrificed. And in addition, it is not guaranteed that any reduced order plan can be feasible to execute on the full order dynamics. Uh, this is because it can happen that the robot operating condition can break the assumptions of the reduced order model, as we will see in a second. But often, uh, but often it works pretty well in practice. Okay, now let's see how we can actually tackle this problem. We start with the full step planner. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're gonna use the reduced order model. Okay, so how do we go about you know, deriving a reduced dynamic model uh, of a bipedal system like this? So one way to do it is to think of a, reasonable, a, a chain of reasonable physical assumption. Uh, one thing people typically do to start is say, I don't want to worry about the torque saturations. Okay, this is actually a not bad assumption because the actuators are quite powerful for a miniature bipedal robot like Bruce. And what we and what happens then is you already have a significant simplification of dynamics. Now we are not writing down the equation in the complicated 16 generalized coordinates. We can just reason about uh, the net external range acting on the system, uh, correspond to the rates of change of the linear and angular momentum, and the so-called centroidal dynamic model. We can go further and say that if the contact of the system is sort of locally planar, then we don't have to worry about some set of ground reaction force. We can just um, focus on the center pressure, just sort of a weighted average, and the ground reaction force on that point, and the net ground reaction force at that point. And we can say further that the angular momentum of the system is uh, is negligibly small, which is often the case, and verified by some uh, biomechanic study, then we simply have this term equal to zero. And what we get back is the ground reaction force has to be pointing towards the center of mass, and it will be in this form. Okay? And here, omega is just some parameter needs to be determined. We can make one more assumption that, you know, uh, you know, we know something about the center of mass height. Either it's you know, following some nominal trajectory or it's simply constant on a flat wall. Then we can solve this omega value. Okay? So the resulting dynamics is called the linear inverted pendulum model as the system dynamics is linear and the robot you know, supporting itself on a single leg resembles an inverted pendulum. The system states is the horizontal CLM, CLM position because the vertical motion is constrained the control input is the um, center of pressure, which corresponds to the first step location. Uh, we can easily convert it into the state space form. And tr to analyze the system, we can perform a coordinate transform. If we can define a transform equation in a clever way, we can derive a new state called C, which is just a linear combination of the CM position and velocity. And here's our new system. And apparently, we can see the new system has one unstable mode and one stable mode, which suggests that instead of focusing on both modes, we can just focus on the unstable mode. As long as the unstable mode is well controlled and bounded, 
the robot will not diverge, meaning the robot will not fall down. And due to this reason, this new state C is called the divergent component of motion. We can have a diagram to better illustrate the system dynamics. So the new system has two states, the COM and the DCM. The COM dynamics is stable, as it's always you know, following the DCM. The DCM dynamics is unstable because it's pushed away by the COP. So as time passes, the DCM will just diverge and the COM will follow and diverge at will. So to prevent the system from diverging, we can try to manipulate the COP. With that, our DCM will be pushed away by the new COP position and our COM will follow as well. So from this illustration, we can see that if we can control the COP, in a clever way to the right location at the right time, we can not only make sure the system is bounded, that is the robot will not fall down, but also we can try to create some stable period orbits for working. Okay. So let's have a quick summary of the reduced order model we're gonna use for our full step planner. So far we have been talking about the stance phase, that is one foot is contact with the ground. However, in order to achieve Running and hoping, we also need to consider a flight phase. Uh, and fortunately, during the flight phase, no external force except gravity can affect the COM state. So we can simply use a ballistic model to describe the motion. And we derive the dynamics, the COM and the DCM. And similarly, in, during the flight phase, we can also derive the COM dynamics. And based on the DCM definition, we can also derive its dynamics. What's more, these dynamics are simple enough to be analytically integrated. So we don't need to worry about the granularity of the discretization of the model during the, during the planning process, which can, be computational, which can be computationally expensive. And here, law, sigma, eta are just some known functions, and r and b are just a change of variable to make the equation look compact. And here, R is the COM offset, B is the DCM offset relative to the central pressure. And of course, we're going to focus on the DCM because it's the important mode. Okay, so now we have the analytical dynamics, makes, which makes easier to derive the nominal big pattern, which is you know, just some periodic trajectories of the reduced order model, which will actually serve as the uh, reference for our first step planner. So here's a diagram, which uh, you can consider the robot is moving in the positive x direction. Uh, the, the yellow dots denote the left foot, the green dot denote the right foot, and it's two gate cycles. So to sustain periodicity, we need to have some constraint on the states, right? This simply means the robot state needs to equal to it, it itself up to two gate cycles if we are alternating left and right foot. And using the uh, analytical dynamics, we can easily solve for the nominal values. Okay, and this one is for the DCM offset. And here, alpha, beta are just some um, you know, change of variable. We can see the nominal values depending on the step length air x and the step width step y, which can be computed simply based on the desired velocity. And meanwhile, in the latter direction, we also need to consider a dy which is due to the pelvis width, because you know when the robot is moving, we don't want the two legs too close to each other to prevent collision, okay, so, Can I just ask, uh, just to make sure, when you're talking about uh, this, the, the first two equations mm -hmm. basically ensure periodicity, right? By, yes, yes. By, these are kind of like boundary conditions. Boundary condition. Yeah, right, so, okay, so you're gonna, Ensure the periodicity by in, by having initial and terminal boundary conditions, which you have to satisfy. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and once we have the boundary, and once we have the nominal, uh, once we have the boundary, and once we have the you know the analytical dynamics, we can solve for the nominal values. And also, we will have a dy in the lateral direction. As I said, we need to specify a clearance between the two feet to prevent collision. Once we have the nominal gate pattern, we can just plot it, see how it will change once the parameter is changing. And this one is in terms of stance duration. As we can see, when the stance duration is increasing, the robot uh, will swing more in the lateral direction. So based on this, we kind of know how to choose TS in order to have a good working posture. 
And meanwhile, when, when TS is increasing, we also have, uh, we also see that the step length increase as well. However, for an actual robot, uh, we cannot have arbitrary large steps, neither can we have arbitrary short stance duration, uh, which basically means the real robots are limited. We cannot place the foot to anywhere at any time we want. So this actually... Well, let me ask you a question. Is the, is the, uh, do you optimize with respect to the step? In yes. Other words, yes. Uh, as well, is that one of the control parameters? Yeah, the control parameter is the step location. Well, okay, but but basically the time interval from you know B, or I guess I'm not sure exactly what B is, but from B zero to B two tau two T or something, the time interval between there is that optimized as well? Yes, yes. For the current gate cycle, the time is also optimized. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go ahead. So as, as I said, the real robots are, are limited. We cannot place the foot to anywhere at any time we want. Okay? This, actress, uh, this actually suggests, uh, implies that uh, there must exist some boundary that if the robot stays across this boundary, the robot cannot handle and might fall down. And we can try to investigate this limit, and the process is called viability analysis. And the tool we're going to use is called end step capturability, the ability of robot to come to a stop by taking end steps. For example, if my current DCM is right on top of my COP, the offset is equal to zero, then the DCM will not be pushed to anywhere, therefore I don't need to take any steps to come to a stop. However, if my offset is non-zero, which means I'm starting to tip over, then I might need to take one or two steps to come to a stop. However, if my offset is too large, then probably I cannot avoid falling down because the DCM will just diverge too fast. Okay? So mathematically, let's say in the X direction, let's say the state is n step catchable, meaning the initial DCM offset is upper bounded. And then after one gate cycle, the DCM offset is going to be n minus one uh, step catchable, right? And since we have the analytical uh, dynamics, we can evaluate BXT using BX0. And here's, uh, after some rearrangement, this is the result. Now we have a new upper bound, and this upper bound will be maximized when we take the largest step using the shortest step, because this is the best we can do in order to prevent falling. And now these two boundaries should equal to each other, which leads to a recursive expression and we can easily solve this geometric series, and by taking the limit, we can find the infinite step capturability, uh, capturability bound, which is equivalent to the DCM offset limit. Okay, because theoretically, it takes the robot infinite steps to come to, to come to stop. Basically, it means the robot will not stop at all, and any value greater than that, the robot cannot fall, cannot handle and will just fall down. Again, we can use some diagram to uh, to illustrate the viability condition. Suppose at some time, uh, given the left foot position of the current gate cycle, we can first derive the feasible footstep region for, uh, of the next gate cycle, you know, based on the constraint on the step length and step width. So it's this green box. And then the viable set of the robot state, the DCM state, can be derived by further adding the DCM offset limit. It's this gray box. The system is viable. That it means the robot will not fall down as long as the DCM offset of the next gate cycle is within this gray box. Because I can always try to find a footstep location to make sure the DCM offset is bounded by the limit we find. However, if the DCM is outside of this gray box, the best we can do is just step on this corner However, as you can see, the DCM offset is still larger than its limit. So the robot will cannot avoid falling down and might need to, do, might need to prepare for that. Okay, so that's the viability condition. Okay, so now we have talked about uh, the reduced order dynamics, the nominal gate pattern, the viability analysis. We have everything for our full stand planner. So let's try to formulate this trajectory optimization problem. Uh, the full step planner adapts the nominal gate pattern, so the cost function gonna penalize 
uh, the state deviation with their nominal values. Okay. Of course, in the least square sense, where the vector norm square is defined as this. Uh, the first term is for the step length, and the second term is for the distance offset. The last two are for the phase duration. Okay. And also, we are considering a few steps ahead of time. So the capital N is the number of previous steps into the future. So the decision variables uh, will be the first step, first step locations, pk, uh, the DCM offset pk for the next n phase cycles. And meanwhile, we are also optimizing the phase duration. And note that we are using eta ts, eta ts instead of ts directly uh, to, uh, to ensure the linearity of the constraints. So the constraint is, of course, the system dynamics. So using uh, the analytical dynamics, we can easily predict our state Kc. Uh, Kc1 is the state corresponding to the up upcoming touchdown moment. Either we are during the stance phase or during the flight phase, we can predict Kc1 based on the current measurement. And in the long run, we can also uh, predict the decision evolution for the next n minus one gauge cycles. And again, the robot is limited, so we also have some constraint on the step lens. We have some constraint on the phase durations, like this. And finally, to ensure the robot will not fall down, we also need to specify the viability constraint, right? Just, we just talked about it. However, if the robot cannot avoid falling down, adding this constraint can make the problem infeasible because there's no way the robot can recover. So in practice, we just remove this constraint, and instead, we would increase the weight WB so that it will guide the planar DCM offset as close to the as close to the nominal value as possible, uh, uh, as close to the nominal value as possible, even though viability is not is not guaranteed. Because in this way, we can always have a solution. Hey, can I ask you a question? Sure. When you talk about uh, close, uh, so you have a perturbation which I guess is zeta zeta. Zeta. And you're and you're comparing that to the uh, nominal path. Nominal path. Uh, yeah. Yes. Nominal path. Uh, but basically, um, when you when you do that, you you make it, is the perturbation basically some uh, projection perpendicular to where the nominal path is because the nominal path is in time. Mm -hmm. You're in, you're using time. You don't make a perturbation at the same time. You make a perturbation in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, you, Exactly, how do you compare zeta with the nominal path, I guess is what I'm asking. Uh, can you repeat your question again? Well, what I'm asking is how do you, you, you your the nominal is, is, is a time function, right? Yes, yes. And, your, and zeta is your perturbations off, you're infusing time. So when you make the perturbation, how do you make the perturbation? Is it with respect to the same time? Uh, do you make a perturbation with, uh, with respect to uh, where you are perpendicular? Uh, it's up, it's up uh, 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 away from the, 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 uh, the uh, nominal path. I'm just kind of wondering how you make, how you decide on on what your perturbation away from the nominal path is, given where you are. Yeah. So first, the the nominal values is not is is just a value. It's not a time series. It's just a nominal value. So where so where on that nominal do you choose? I mean, it's all it's, it's yeah. So yeah. So, yeah. So the, the nominal values is at each touchdown moment. It's in a moment, right? It's, the, uh, it's, yeah. it, it, it's a function of t time, in some sense, some independent variable. Mm -hmm. I'm just sort of wondering how you uh, how you make a perturbation away from the nominal path. How do you define it? That, all I'm asking is a definition of how you define a perturbation away. How do you compare where you are? with a value on the nominal path. What do you choose on the nominal path as the value you are going to use to make a perturbation? Is it just maybe an orthogonal uh, perpendicular to the path or some sort or something of that sort? 
So because the mm -hmm. yeah. So so the, so right now. Uh, You mean the definition of the perturbation? Yeah. Okay. Right. The definition of the perturbation. The perturbation, right. perturbation. Right now, everything is linear, so you can just consider it in one dimension. In one dimension. So it's just the difference between the current state and the nominal state. But the nominal state is a. It could be anywhere, right? Where Where on the nominal do you pick? Uh, as I said, the nominal value is at each touchdown moment. Okay. So it's just a value at each touchdown. Yeah, but you could pick it at t. You could pick it at p tau. You could pick it at p one. You could pick it somewhere in between. Where, where, where do you compare data to? That's all I'm asking. Yeah. So we are picking either zero, either t equal to zero or t equal to the capital T. Yeah, that's the that's actually the boundary. Could he be asking where the nominal time comes from? Is that from the previous analysis that you were doing? Like TF norm, where is that coming from? No. TF norm is just a nominal value you define by yourself. Yeah, yeah, I, I think is that what he's asking? He's trying, uh, I think, Professor, he's trying to ask the definition of the perturbation at which time? Well, you're at the current time now, right? Yeah. You've got an actual state. Yeah, I'm just asking, you're at that state and you want to compare it to your nominal trajectory. Yes. And I'm just yeah. sort of wondering what point on the nominal trajectory mm -hmm. do you choose in order to make the perturbation. Yes. So right now the time is tall. Okay. Right now the time is tall, but I'm comparing the state at uh, at touchdown. So that's the end of the nominal trajectory. That's the final state. So you're at, at so you're at, at zeta tau. Yeah. Right now we are at zeta tau. Yeah. But we are comparing okay. and at zeta tau is compared with where? Zeta tau is from the current measurement. We are using the dynamics right. to predict zeta one. Right. Yeah. Okay. You're gonna predict zeta one. Yeah. Zeta one is then I compare this to the nominal values. I but, try. But basically, you're making a perturbation. So don't you compare it somewhere with res a, a perturbation with respect to the to the um, normal path. Oh, yes. Oh, I see the confusion is. So basically, zeta 1 is equal to uh, B1 plus P1. And as you can see, the decision variable is actually p the location. We are not we are not comparing zeta one. We are actually com comparing b one because b one is the actual nominal nominal value. Yeah, we're gonna com we're gonna compare with the nominal trajectory. And b one is at uh, at, at 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 what time? At the touchdown. At the next touchdown. Right now, the food is. Oh, in is that the uh, okay, so it's at the touch point. It's touch point, yeah. Right now. I have one below there, so zeta tau yeah. is somewhere there. So you're going to use b one mm -hmm. plus and row one is what? Uh, this is p one. P one is the next full oh. set location. We're going to optimize. Yeah, we try to optimize p one and b one simultaneously. P one is the next full set location.
So you're generating a brand new, uh, so in a sense you're, you're generating not a perturbation, but a brand new trajectory. Exactly, exactly. I'm trying to replanning a new trajectory as close to the nominal trajectory as possible. Okay, then that's all in your cost function. Yes, yes. I see. So the cost function keeps you close. Keep you close. But what you're, but what you're doing is finding the underlining uh, parameters that are associated with um, each of those points, mm -hmm. like B1 and things like that. Yeah, things like that. Which we had before. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the full stem planner is trying to replaning the trajectory as close to the nominal trajectory as possible. Yeah. But it's based on the current measurement, the current state of the robot. Okay. 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 Thank you. So. Essentially, the full stem planner, the optimization program can be transcribed into a quadratic program because the cost is in a quadratic form and all the constraints are linear. The reason why we want to do it in this way is because if feasible, QP can be solved very efficiently and uh, with guaranteed global optimality. Okay? And, of, and there are a lot of off-the-shelf QP solvers we can just utilize. For example, always QP, which has proven to be a uh, to have a very good numerical stability. And finally, based on our film formulation, our full step planner is really a small scale QP problem, even with multiple steps planned ahead of time, and which can be solved uh, in practice at a rate of 500 hertz, uh, sufficient for uh, real time replanning. Okay, so now let's just test the full stand planner, we first implement it on the reduced order model, meaning the model the controller uses exactly the same as the exactly the same as the simulation model. And meanwhile, uh, we have a timing gap mechanism because we don't want to move a lot at the end of the gate cycle. So we actually stop planning sometime before the gate cycle ends. Okay? And these are just some parameters of the simulation, for example, the weight of the robot, the height of the robot. And as you can see, uh, this WB is set significantly larger than other parameters in order uh, for the viability. Okay, now let's just run the simulation. When the robot is moving in the positive x direction, we push it to its left. As you can see, uh, the push is very strong, and the robot took several reactive steps to come to a stop. And here's the optimized phase duration. You can also see that when it's first pushed, the phase duration drops. Uh, phase, uh, the phase duration drops significantly, which means the robot is taking a very fast step in order to prevent falling down. And also due to the timing gap mechanism, it stops planning sometime before the gate cycle ends. And basically, we verify our full stand planner works. And by the way, this is only for the result n equal to one, meaning we are only planning for the next step. We also try to investigate the number, the effect of the number of previous steps on the system. And here's the result for n equal to 2. We can see the performers uh, improve significantly. The robots can recover faster and it's closer to its original path. And the planned phase duration is also less chaotic. Okay? This is due to the fact that the full step planner is more aware of future information to have an overall better plan. Okay, because right now we are not considering the lag crossing scenario, which will limit the feasible star region in the lateral direction. If the full stand planner knows, okay, in the next day cycle, I cannot compensate, I cannot catch the fall too much, it will make more efforts in the current gate cycle. Okay, and here's the result for n equal to 3, and as we can see, it gets even better. We also try n greater than 3, however, uh, it will not significantly improve anymore. <coughs> so you can see kind of it converge. Okay, we we'll also try to investigate the system robustness, that is the maximum push the robot can resist before falling down. So in each push direction, we gradually increase the, fall, uh, the force until the robot falls down. So with phase duration fixed, if we do not optimize the phase duration, the force region is like this. If we optimize the phase duration as well, the force region expands significantly. 
So from this, we can conclude that optimization phase uh, duration is as critical as footstep planner, a uh, footstep location to bipedal locomotion. And by the way, these are only the theoretical boundary uh, based on the viability analysis. We can easily verify these theoretical boundaries using simulation. And with phase duration fixed, the simulation results will match the theoretical boundary no matter how many steps you plan. Because the best you can do is just take the largest step. Uh, with phase duration optimized, the phase duration, the force region uh, gets bigger and bigger as n gets bigger. However, they do not quite match the theoretical boundary, again due to the timing gap mechanism. You know, it stops planning sometime before the gate cycle ends, and there's no response during that time, uh, which will essentially decrease the system stability margin. Okay, so based on these simulation results, uh, we can say n equal to three is a wise choice in terms of system robusting, transient behavior, and computational efficiency. Okay, so that's pretty much about the full stand planner. Now let's have a discussion on the whole body control, which actually makes the robot move. <coughs> uh, whole body control is a good candidate for simultaneous execution of multiple tasks uh, uh, for a redundant floating-based robots, you know, interacting with the environment. Uh, in addition, it can create uh, very fast, agile, compliant motions, yet without sacrifi sacrificing accuracy. It typically uses inverse dynamics to properly handle the contact force interaction with the environment. However, you know, ID-based whole body control heavily depends on the high quality of the dynamic model, which is often difficult to obtain in practice. And on the contrary, the robot kinematic model is much easier to get with high accuracy. So examples also exist which are based on the inverse kinematics or even a combination of both. And uh, in addition, early approaches usually consider trajectories in the joint space, resulting in an incredible amount of you know, motion details. And other countries, operational space control is disburdened by designing the trajectories in the intuitive operational space. However, all these methods uh, do not, uh, cannot handle contest stability or joint limits well, uh, the violation of which can easily cause poor performance or even control failure. And lately, an elegant way to implement whole body control is again using optimization, mostly QPs, which can uh, satisfy the various physical constraints concurrently. And finally, depending on how the task priority is, uh, is managed in the whole body control, it can be categorized, it can be categorized into two types. A weighted whole body control sets all the operational space tasks as the costs of a single QP with different weights. A strictly, hierarchical, uh, a strictly hierarchical framework solves cascaded QPs from the highest priority to the lowest priority. And in our framework, we're going to use the inverse dynamics because uh, we, have a good, uh, we actually have a good dynamic model due to the motor transparency. We're going to work in the operational space because uh, the reduced order plan does not consider the, mo the joint motions. We're going to utilize optimization again to properly handle the various physical constraints. And finally, we're going to choose implicit hierarchy because uh, in, in consideration of the computational cost, because we only need to solve one QP instead of multiple ones. OK, so now let's see how we can actually formulate this implicitly hierarchical operational space inverse dynamic based all about the control using optimization. So since we are considering dynamics, we're going to work on the acceleration level. So given designed operational space acceleration, uh, the, goal, the goal of Hobart Control is trying to find the, dynamic, the instantaneous required dynamically consistent joint acceleration, joint torques, and contact force. Since, uh, since we are tracking some reference, we're going to penalize the deviation, from, deviation between them. And as you can see, the ICE operational space task is set as a QP cost with priority being, being implicitly enforced uh, with a weight WI. And here, JI is the task Jacobian. And our desired acceleration consists of both feed forward and feedback terms in a PD form. And in addition, we also add some uh, 
regularization terms to make sure the overall QB cost is always positive definite, even if even if you know the task Jacobian can, has some uh, singularity, which can avoid uh, potential numerical uh, issues. And finally, the constraint is of course our Ford dynamics, our floating base model, as well as the contact constraint, zero contact acceleration, and the friction core. So let's take a look at each component. So the first one is system dynamics. We have been talking about you know, the forward dynamics, which is way too complicated for the planning. However, the instantaneous system dynamics is actually linear in terms of the different variables, because the other variables can be obtained from the measurement. And notably, the system dynamics can be split into two parts, the floating base dynamics and the joint dynamics. To accelerate the QP performance, we can uh, we can only focus on the floating base dynamics because in this manner n, uh, n constraints can be removed. Meanwhile, variables for, for the joint talk for the joint talks can be removed as well if we assume that there's always enough talk to achieve the generated motions. And in the end, once the QP is solved, we can easily compute the optimal joint torque based on the optimal joint acceleration and contact force. And the next one is the contact constraint. Um, for Bruce with a line feed, we consider two contact points for each foot, the toe and the heel. For each contact point, we need to specify um, zero contact acceleration constraint to prevent the foot from moving, right? And in practice, we can consider it as one of the operational space tasks. That is a soft constraint, because in this manner, we can uh, speed up the QP and have better numerical stability. Meanwhile, the contact force is constrained within the local friction cone, right? And which is further, which is further approximated by a square pyramid for linearity. Okay, so control the total orientation is, also, is one of the operational space tasks because it is essential for a good working posture. Definitely, we want to avoid the unwanted torsion oscillations, which can largely affect the CO motion and the complicated control process. And control uh, the centroidal momentum is also a critical component of whole body control. It contains two components, the linear momentum and angular momentum. The linear part has a straightforward relationship with the CO and velocity. So in the vertical direction, it simply maintain a nominal height to match the reduced order, to, to match the reduced order model. In the horizontal plane, <coughs> it's simply tracking the design ax, designed velocity with a low priority because the robot movement is essentially realized by taking steps. For the angular momentum, as we mentioned before, it is well regulated to near zero for human working. So the task objective is just to damp out the excessive angular momentum. Okay, so swing foot task. The reduced order plan is essentially realized by the swing foot task of whole, of whole body control. And we need to consider both foot orientation and foot position. The swing foot orientation reference can be simply set to some constant. However, recall that each leg of Bruce has only five degrees of freedom. So the roll motion is actually not controlled because it has the least effect for a line foot. And meanwhile, the robot is actually working blindly uh, with, with no terrain information. So the gain in the pitch direction is intentionally set low, which can make the foot adaptive to a certain range of terrain. And the foot position trajectory needs to be carefully designed because uh, in, in order to adapt in order to adapt the changing for style location and the timing from the reduced order plane, right? So for example, in the horizontal plane, uh, for at some time tau, when a new step is planned with optimal solution P star and T star, uh, the foot position trajectory is regenerated using a fifth order polynomial, uh, which to ensure the continuity up to the acceleration level, okay? And finally, during contact changes, we also need to perform task transitions. This is, for example, uh, the linear momentum cannot be controlled during the flat phase, right? And another example is when, for a stance foot, 
its stance counter constraint is activated while, the, uh, while its swing foot uh, task is deactivated. This can be simply handled by you know, changing the relative uh, task weight. For example, if uh, task is deactivated, we can set its uh, weight to zero and we can easily bring it back when it's become activated again. Okay, so that's pretty much about our whole body control um, using QP, which can be solved in practice at 500 as well, ready for feedback, real-time feedback control. And before making the robot taking steps, we test its balancing performance. And here Bruce is trying to maintain its nominal standing posture with all constant reference. We can see it can reject the disturbance pretty well in all directions, and meanwhile, it can produce very compliant behaviors. Okay, so that's our whole body control. And finally, the control framework cannot be complete with a state estimation. So let's have a quick discussion on that. So for bipedal locomotion, an accurate estimation of the folding base joint is of particular importance because it takes a lead in describing the system dynamics, right? And while Common Future uh, has been implemented in various forms, Complementary Future works robustly as well in practice. And unlike other mobile robots, bipedal locomotion, a bipedal robot uh, experience intermittent contact with the ground during locomotion which suggests a unique estimation approach by combining the onboard IMU and the robot kinetic model. So in particular, the prediction model is based on the acceleration model, uh, the acceleration measurement from the IMU, you know, its integration to get the base linear position and the velocity. And usually the orientation information is good to use directly. And whenever a foot is in contact with the ground, it's assumed to be stationary the position is fixed, the velocity is equal to zero. And with that, we can reversely calculate the base uh, linear position and velocity using the Stensler kinematics. So, uh, to, you know, to correct the a priori estimations. So this is how the bipedal estimation works. And once we have the estimation of the floating base joint, we can add the joint information to derive the model for the entire robot. And from there, we can get, for example, the center of mass position and the velocity, the swing foot position and velocity, etc. Okay, so we have covered everything. Now just combine them together, run the controller, and make the robot make the robot move on its own. And extensive theories of simulation and ex hardware experiments were conducted. And let's start with the simulation result. And this one is <coughs> working, where we do not consider a flight uh, where we do not consider a flight phase. With a non-zero flight duration, the robot is also capable of running. And without alternating the two legs, if we just stick to one single leg, the robot is also capable of single leg hopping. And then if we consider the center of pressure location is at the middle of the tube foot, the robot is also capable of double leg hopping. Okay, so that's just some typical bipedal locomotion gates, but our framework is versatile as it is possible to generate any arbitrary bipedal gates by simply changing the nominal gate pattern. For example, we can have a clearance in the X direction we can have a period of four gate cycles instead of just two. And if we just forget about the collision, the robot can also be capable of some fancy dancing motion. Okay, now we can gauge the system uh, in terms of you know, uh, disturbance rejection. And as we can see, the robot is, cap is, is able to recover within the next few steps after each push. And here's the data. As we can see, the robot was adapting both footstep location and timing uh, in order to prevent falling down, right? And this is exactly what we have seen in the reduced order simulation. We can also try to compare their steady state trajectory. 
and as you can see, uh, they are actually very close to each other, which verifies our model simplification assumptions. We can also gauge the system in terms of theory and uncertainty. So we challenge the boost um, some uneven terrain. While the controller is, is assuming the ground is always flat, uh, it can still handle some, some ground height variation. And of course, it's not just step in place or forward. It can produce omnidirectional working, <coughs> forward and backward, left and right, and also self-rotation. And from there, we can have any combinations of these fundamental motions. And finally, just want to illustrate how many tasks our whole body control is regulating at the same time. So the first is, of course, the foot orientation, the center of mass height, the foot clearance, and of course the torso orientation. So as you can see, our framework can still handle this, this configuration. Okay. So the working controller is also implemented on the real physical system. A similar push recovery test was conducted where we push robots uh, in different uh, locations uh, in various uh, directions and yeah, with random time and random uh, with random and random time with random duration, and the robot was able to manage to survive. Them. We also challenge the robot with several irregular terrain. This one is uneven, where the robot was able to work with some ground height variation. And this one, Bruce was actually stepping on some yoga mat. This kind of soft terrain is challenging as the stance field cannot keep stationary which can easily cause oscillation or even uh, this uh, instability of the system. However, our controller can still handle that. And this one, Bruce Robot was actually stepping on some foam boards which can easily slide on the ground. The sliding can also mess up the estimation which assumed fixed contact, but our framework can still handle. Yeah, if the system is robust enough, we are very glad to bring our robot to an international conference in Philly this May. And it was a huge success. You know, people just loved Bruce because it's so cute when it's doing the stepping. Okay, so that's pretty much about it. Let's have a quick summary. Uh, in this dissertation, uh, a, bipe a Bruce and the next generation miniature bipedal robot is being under development in specific the cable-driven differential pulley system and the linkage mechanism were designed to reduce the lag weight and inertia capable of a dynamic behavior. And meanwhile, uh, proprioceptive actuations is also equipped on the robot for compliant interaction with the ground. And second, a dynamic bipedal locomotion control framework is being proposed where the high level plans the footsteps and the low level controls the whole body motion while establish the full contact as planned, which is capable of walking, running, hopping gates, etc. And here's some major contribution of this dissertation. First, as the boot system is reliable and cost-effective. We are working on making it an open source platform for the robotics community where in the near future, which we envision can boost the studies of humanoid robots. As for the locomotion control framework, 
previous works only concentrate on the working scenario. Our framework extends previous works by further considering a 5 8 which is capable of a much wider range of bipedal gates. And whenever you design the locomotion, bipedal locomotion control, you always ask the question, how many steps ahead should we plan? While previous studies only consider a preview of adequate steps in order to uh, ensure the system viability, our results indicate three previous steps is enough, and it is actually a wise choice in terms of system robustness, transient behavior, and computational efficiency. And last but not least, an extensive theory of simulation and hardware experiments were conducted to uh, demonstrate the versatility and robustness of the approach. And in the future, uh, an upgraded upper body uh, with arms will be added to Bruce for more capabilities, for example, standing up on its own, local manipulation, etc. For the locomotion control framework, realizing the ringing and the hopping gates uh, with the physical system is also on the future list. And meanwhile, with an upgraded upper body, arm assist locomotion uh, can be invested for, for stronger robustness. And here's the publication list, and these five papers are the most relevant to this dissertation. Yeah, and yeah, finally, I want to say thank you first to my advisor, Professor Hong, and to my committee member, Professor Spire, Professor Iwasaki, and Professor Hopkins, and to anyone who, to anyone who is a part of my lab, Romila, and of course to my family and friends, and last but not least, to my Bruce team, because this, this, this dissertation is impossible without your help. Uh, uh, I, I cannot do this all alone by myself, <coughs> in particular, Aaron, Nick, Hulkery team, and me. So it all starts three years ago when we have only a simple, simple concept. And at that time, we only have a very easy 3D printed leg, which can easily break from time to time. And then the pandemic came, everything was delayed. But at that time, we were thinking about we need to change the double gear. And the conclusion, as you know, is the cable pulley driven system. And with that, our bush, the leg can finally make its first jumping. And of course, some other 3D power can break from time to time, but it's fine. And once we have enough test with a single leg, we finalized the design and built our first first version of Bruce. A month later, Bruce can stand on its own. Yeah, and then we just play with the robot. <laughs> this one, uh, as you saw, is uh, CISO balancing uh, to verify the kinematic model. And this is whole body control, but at that time, as you can see, the dynamic model is not accurate enough. The control frequency is pretty low. The gains are not well tuned, so the performance is kind of weird, but you know it's doing something. And then we just study the locomotion. Uh, we first test an open loop trajectory, you know, just to feel the robot to see how it will behave. And we just start testing this current framework at the beginning of this year. And by the way, this is Bruce's first control step. And just when we're trying to add more steps, Apparently, there are some bugs in the code. The robot went crazy and break its foot. And a month later, Bruce can make 10 control walks. And after that, we just you know kept increasing the steps, kept, in, kept uh, breaking the feet, and eventually, we have something close. And Bruce went fully untethered, dismay, and the, the controller, you know, was more or less finished. And it was just before our trip to the conference, where Bruce made its debut, surrounded by all the big names, you know, uh, Boston Dynamics, Unitry, uh, Animals, Agility Robotics. Yeah. And by the way, Bruce was here. And that concludes, uh, that ends the story of Bruce, chapter one because I believe this is just the beginning of start, this is just the beginning of something big. We see a lot of potential in this robot. So stay tuned, everyone. And with that, I'm ready for Q&A. Thanks for listening.
uh, open, uh, we're going to open up to the uh, audience for any questions. Or oh, anybody on the Zoom does any questions? I hear you. Yeah. Are you open for questions? Is that the point? Yes, I'm open for questions. Okay. Hey, tell me about the uh, IMU. Um, is it an expensive IMU? Is it drift? Uh, do you have any problems with it uh, in terms of balancing things of that sort? So in terms of the IMU? Yeah. Yeah, it's very small. Yeah, usually the IMU uh, yeah, usually if you just integration of the acceleration, you will have drift. But you know, we also uh, correct the estimation using the stance-like kinematics, so it works pretty well. You what? You you correct? You you calibrate it? No, you uh, so, we correct the a prior estimation using the robot kinematic model. So when the foot is in contact with the ground, the contact point is assumed to be stationary. So we can inverse reversely calculate the base position and linear position and velocity using the using the robot kinematic model. So the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're saying. Are you, are you sure are you saying you you correct the I and U somehow? Is it is it re recalibration or is it just a, just a calculation of some of the biases or what? Uh, we are not calibration the IMU. So the prediction model is using the IMU, you know, integration to get the velocity and the position. Mm -hmm. And then the measurement model is using the stance like kinematics. So we can correct the IMU drift. Because when a foot is in contact ground, the contact location can be assumed stationary. And okay, so, that, so if the IMU is an error, you correct the IMU mm -hmm. because you know where the, the because the foot is in contact with the floor. Right? Yes, yes. The contact location is assumed to be fixed. In a sense, you are calibrating the IMU, right? Uh, yes. By, okay. by using that, that, so that's one way of, of, of calibrating it. But that's, is, is, is there any problems with uh, attitude or things of that sort as well? Uh, I think it works pretty well in practice, yeah. But you're saying it drifts. What is the kind of the drift rate you might get out of this? So, so as I said, if you're just using the IMU integration, it will drift. But you correct with, with the lack kinematics, it will not drift. Well, that's just, you know, I mean, the drift that, you know, you have accelerometers that can be drifting, you have uh, gyros that drift. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't correct at all, does it? Does it correct the attitude and things of that sort as well? Oh, so you the attitude you mean you mean the height of the robot? The yaw. The yaw, well, the, the yaw the of the pitch, robot? The roll, the pitch, the roll, and the, the height sort of part of the, the, the uh, Yeah, usually the pitch and the roll will not drift because, yeah, usually the yaw and the pitch will not drift, the yaw will drift a little bit, but, yeah. Why does it, uh, why does it pitch and uh, roll not drift? Uh, because you can, yeah, so for the orientation part, you can either using a very expensive IMU, they can calibrate for you, so, uh, so the yaw and the pitch uh, will not drift. You can also, try to do it yourself. For example, uh, you can using the acceleration, because the acceleration, the, so if the robot is assumed have a low acceleration, then, then uh, you know it's always pointing downwards, then you can use the acceleration measurement to correct for the pitch and roll as well. And so all of that is basically implemented in your robot, right? Yes, everything is implemented. Yeah, but it's just okay. too much detail, so I didn't cover everything. Yeah, it's a lot of detail. Too much detail, yeah. 
It's a whole laboratory of detail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Go. Cool. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And um, we asked a question about like the the structure for your overview of the uh, the rules, like the upper level control and low level control for the first step. Yeah. This yeah, picture, please. Yeah. So like uh, as you mentioned, the high level is full step planning, right? And yes. the low level is the whole body control. But I just wonder, like the frequency for these two controllers are seemingly the same on your presentation, but uh, I don't know, like maybe for the low level control, should it be a little bit higher, like the frequency should be a lot higher than the, you know, the upper level controller, so that the lower level controller can actuate the, the command uh, completely, I mean, uh, before getting another command from the high level control. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wonder uh, why you just set them to be the same. Or yeah, yeah, I, I know your question. So, thank you. Yeah, so usually the first step planning, you can set it, um, you can try to, let's say, have 100 hertz. Maybe it's good enough. But of course, the faster, the faster, the faster it is, the better you can recover, right? So mm -hmm. that's the reason why we want to have as fast solution as possible. So, like the frequency, the higher level frequency cannot be greater than the frequency for the lower level control. Right? Yeah, so if it's greater than then then, then the low level cannot actually catch all the yeah, information yeah, yeah, from true. the okay. kind of whole plane. Yeah. Logically the whole body control, <coughs> the low level you have the higher frequency you should have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I asked yeah. one question. Yeah, go ahead. So does whole, whole body controller also control the swing foot or not? Swing foot is just like kinematics. Yes, yes. So so okay. whole, yeah, the whole body control is control everything, also the swing foot. Was that okay, so you so since they are the same frequency, so you plan one foot step and then you you control one time of your body motion? In your main loop. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's the same, the same time for controlling the both the foot and the orientation. Yeah. Okay. We miss you, Shen. Yeah. I don't know you. Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Former graduate. Yeah. By the way, also is not very happy. <laughs> okay. We can talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> so, sorry, Badger. Digress. We didn't have a question yet. So I think you said three step prediction is beyond three steps, we didn't see much uh, performance increase. Yes. And regarding that, so I have two questions about that. One is what's your metric of performance? Oh, and the metric of performance. Yeah, yeah. How, like, what are you looking at to say, oh, not seeing much more <coughs> Second is, so all this is based on some nominal height, some nominal mass for the inverted control model. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So depending on the height difference and the mass difference, can that number, do you think that number will change or something around that? First one is for the metrics. Uh, so, so uh, I say three steps is a wise choice in three perspectives. The first one is for the training behavior, because as you can see, uh, first, uh, as you can see, the trajectory is the robot can recover faster, and the tra trajectory is more close to its original path. And from n equal to one to n equal to two, is the, the improvement is very significant. From n equal to two and to three, and you can see it's only a little bit. Yeah, you can also try to for n equal to four, five, six. They're almost the same as n equal to three. So that's why I say it's kind of converged to something. And this is only for the training behavior, and also it's the same thing for the optimized phase duration. As you can see, it's more or less uh, converged to something. And this is only for and this for the system robustness. So again, 
when when n is increasing, uh, the force uh, the force region expands. But as you can see, it's also approaching some um, converge some uh, some uh, some sort of converge to something. Yeah. So that's for this is neural process. So 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 if your height and your mass change. Yeah, that's a good question. So I didn't check. But I will just assume they should close. Yeah. And, and lastly, based on building up this, would you say the inverted pendulum model is a... So at one point, you showed your simulation model and your actual mm. graph, yeah. and they were similar. Yes. What motivated you? choose to pursue the inverted pendulum model as opposed to some other more complex model? Okay, so... I guess my question is, yeah. we, we know that the model is, can capture some, some dynamics of the model. Yes. But it's not, obviously, it's still incorrect. Mm -hmm. However, at, I guess, what gives you the hint that this is good enough? This is, the model is good yeah, enough. Yeah, the model, this model is good enough. We don't need anything more complex. So, so we definitely need more complex things, but given the current computational power, this is maybe the best we can do, okay? So the first thing why I choose reduce only model is because this advantage, because the, we have an solution, it's computationally efficient, okay, everything is optimal. Um, so this is um, so uh, this is at, at the beginning it's only for working okay at the beginning the model is only for working but once I add the flight phase uh, I'm still using this uh, this model and it appears that it can also it's also good enough for some other bipedal locomotion units for example hopping and winding so maybe the model is good enough when the model is good enough even for some dynamic bipedal gates, as long as maybe it's not highly dynamic. Okay. So if you want to achieve some highly dynamic motion, maybe you need to consider some other model. But right now, um, I don't know how to do that with an optimal solution. Yeah. Because once the model gets complicated, as I just said, the nonlinear optimization has a lot of uh, disadvantage. Still needs to be solved. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much.